I would like to say beforehand that this film is a documentation of just one experience on the Pacific Crest Trail. An experience that can be similar to others, but not replicated. Unique to my time on the trail. My goal at the beginning of this adventure was to document the human experience on trail. The pain and the joy, the discomfort and the reward I expected to find in through hiking. And how those emotions are shared with the people you share the trail with. While I feel I may have fell short of these goals at times, I am proud to be able to share with you the amazing journey that is the Pacific Crest Trail. Now I could have cut half the scenes out to make the film shorter, but selfishly I don't think I can part with any of the memories that are embedded within them. I could have made it into a series, I suppose, to make it more digestible, but that wasn't my experience. The experience I'm sharing occurred day after day until weeks blurred together and the time between borders grew into its own lifetime. So the film remains one continuous documentation of a walk on the Pacific Crest Trail, a quest for Canada. No. See the ridge line up there. A little bit of lightheadedness. Really tired. Feeling everything. Oh yeah. I saw it. This is the life. Ready? Oh, yeah, that's the stuff. <laughs> so cool. How about yours? That's the way you like it, and another good boy. Let me know. <laughs> A lot of uphill. It's not the desert, but it's still hot. Onward. The photo you're looking at is of two brothers about to start an adventure. They're both a bit nervous. One of them's a bit carsick, and neither of them know exactly what to expect. With hopefully everything they need and nothing more packed onto their backs, 
It's the 14th of May, 2021. After our flight from Austin the day before, we find ourselves sitting atop this unassuming hill an hour east of San Diego, divided in half by the US-Mexico border. It's home to the start of an expedition, traveled by foot across the country from border to border, 2,652 miles. Hundreds start at one side or the other every year, but approximately only 60% see the end. It's a challenge and a goal that I'd had my sights on for about three years. And having just finished up my time in the Navy, I can't think of a better opportunity to send it. The first days on trail are just like the first days of most things, I suppose. There's excitement, and then there's an awkward period. In this case, we both knew how to hike and how to camp, but there's all these inefficiencies and small details that you overlook. You have to learn to trust yourself and to trust your gear. God, there's so much shit floating in here. <laughs> All right, I'm full. Dude, I'm drinking my other water first. It's actually not that bad. Twenty-seven miles in by the end of day two, and our bodies started to show the radical change in lifestyle that we had taken on. Aches and pains in your shoulders and back, as well as blisters on your feet, might leave you wondering if you'll even make it to the resupply in Julian. But you've been dreaming of this, and there's no way you're going to end it this early. Life is reduced to meters and miles. Like most adventures, things were going to get harder before they got easier. And on our fourth day into the desert, Cole's IT band was having a hard time adjusting to the miles that we were putting on our legs. With it becoming painful to walk, we found ourselves waiting out the day after hiking just 10 miles. Despite a strong urge to push for Julian and our goal for that day, we made camp and let our bodies rest. An important detail, I think, as some push for an unwritten expectation of 20 mile days. The physical stress of that can provoke injury and bring some through hikes to an early end. The next morning we made the four miles to the highway where we hitchhiked to Julian. We were quickly picked up by a trail angel, a term designated to the community of people that provide an array of services for through hikers called trail magic out of the kindness of their hearts. Now, while hitchhiking is taboo in the States, it's pretty much the main mode of transportation for through hikers going to town. 
and kind of expected by the locals, as they see hikers seasonally every year. Julian is a great introduction to Trail Towns as your first real resupply. Hiker hunger set in quick for us, and thankfully the deli, brewery, and pie shop are all within a short walk of each other. Julian also hosts a small PCT gear shop called Two Foot Adventures, where we picked up some gear to try and help with Cole's IT band. Anxious to get back on trail, we only spent one night in Julian before hitching back, but not before doing some much needed laundry. That's disgusting. <laughs> yeah. It's so gross. Despite our efforts with the compression knee sleeves and the massage ball, Cole was still experiencing pain in his knee. Starting with the day that we left Julian, the miles that we made were completely dependent on the distance we could cover before the pain started to set in. I think both of us were starting to get pretty nervous about the future of our trip, but we would do what we could with what we had. The ground is too loose. I'd like to see you get yours up without any problems. Day, we reached somewhat of an iconic spot on the PCT, Mike's Place. From what we'd seen from previous hikers and with Cole's aching knee, we were both pretty excited to take an afternoon off at Mike's Place. However, to our disappointment, Mike's Place was vacant. All we ended up finding there was some much needed water tanks. But even though Mike's Place was vacant, it was still a very special spot on trail for Cole and I. Because just moments after we had gotten there, a huge group of hikers came from down trail. And even though we knew there were a lot of people attempting the same journey we were, this was the first real group that we had ran into and introduced Tidbits, Blue, Cowbell, Emma, later known as Terminator, Rambo, Rudolph, and Lieutenant Dan. And just a couple of days later, we would meet two more hikers from the group, Sunshine and Daywall. This new group of hikers were kind enough to let Cole and I hike to Paradise Valley Cafe with them. And to Cole and I's surprise, later at Paradise Valley Cafe, we would be invited to share a cabin with some of them in the town of Idlewild. And being able to say yes to stuff like that is one of the best things about the trail. Don't confine yourself to a specific schedule. Allow yourself to do things as they happen. Our stay in Idlewild was everything that we needed. Sitting on the west side of Mount San Jacinto, it was an exciting preview of the alpine environment that we were going to be hiking into in the next couple of days. Loses balance, so we never taught him to, to shake, but he's learning it. Isn't it? They're smart dogs. On the other side of town from where we were staying, there was a little gear shop called Nomad Adventures. While we were there, Cole decided to trade out his Solomon hiking shoes for the more popular Ultra Lone Peaks. With some new gear, the best resupply that we'd had thus far and our new trail family 
we felt prepared to take on Mount San Jacinto. At nearly 11,000 feet, it was the highest elevation that either of us had hiked at before. Amazing birthday, guys. This is definitely one of a kind. We spent two days at the cabin in Idlewild before returning to the trail at mile 151. We expected to lose our new hiking group that afternoon when Cole's knee would flare up. However, we were happily surprised that the new shoes that Cole had picked up seemed to have fixed his knee problem. This is an important detail for those planning a through hike. Knowing what gear works best for you before stepping off can make all the difference. Switching to a different shoe cured the pain overnight and probably saved Cole's hike. And it was just in time too, because the pace with the trail family would be a lot faster than the pace that just the two of us had maintained. first day approaching Mount San Jacinto, we would hike 19 miles and well into the night. The PCT doesn't actually reach the summit of Mount San Jacinto. It breaks for the west, looping around to the other side. However, there is a five and a half mile side trail that'll take you directly to the summit and back down onto the other side to meet back up with the PCT. When we reached the junction, Tidbits, Cole and I broke off from the main group to push for the summit. We would later link back up that evening at a campsite on the north side of the mountain. At nearly a 20 mile day and an 18 and a half mile water carry, for me heading down Mount San Jacinto was one of the harder days on trail. All the downhill pounding on my knees and dehydration quickly brought on a splitting headache and exhaustion. As you zigzag down the switchbacks, you'll quickly find yourself back in the low desert. But what's better at treating dehydration than pizza and beer? And thanks to Baloo, we were able to have just that, that night at our campsite underneath the Interstate 10 bridge. But as it would turn out, that night would sort of be our farewell to Baloo. Unfortunately, the next morning, he would be leaving us. And after our goodbyes, we would be setting off into the desert, moving from water source to water source on our way to our next resupply point at Big Bear Lake. Big Bear Lake would turn out to be much like Idlewild, with the trail family taking a zero, a rest day with zero miles hiked. In a small tourist-based town, we'd do laundry and move from diner to diner, restaurant to restaurant, taking it easy before setting back out into the desert. Oh my gosh. You all right? I so one of the things that became very important in our day to day was foot care. And one of the most common things that people experience on the trail are blisters. And as you could see from pretty much the first week of our hike, blisters were something that we had been dealing with pretty much the whole time. Now there are a couple different strategies when dealing with blisters, involving different tapes and moleskins. But for Cole and I, we would pop them in the evening let them dry out overnight, and then the following morning, wrap the blisters and any hot spots in athletic tape in an attempt to reduce the friction. And unfortunately, at least for us, 
It seems to only get more painful the farther into the desert you get. And at this point I had introduced stretching and massaging the bottoms of my feet in the morning and the afternoon as often as I could with the massage ball we had picked up in Julian. This seemed to serve as a pretty good warm up for my feet before I loaded them that day with the weight of the pack and the miles that we would hike. And maintaining your physical health isn't the only thing that can have a major impact on your hike. I had started the hike with a Z-Pax Arcall 62 liter. Although the pack has an interesting concept in its design with its ultralight carbon fiber frame, I found it to be a little bit too weak for the weight that I was carrying. And it eventually snapped, sending little splinters of carbon fiber into the back of my arm and putting all the weight of my pack onto my shoulders. But thankfully, and I can't overstate how generous people can be on trail. Cowbell's boyfriend, a guy I had only just met who had come to visit her in Big Bear, insisted that I borrow his car to drive over an hour to Nomad Ventures at Joshua Tree National Park so that I could get a new pack. And when I was able to switch to a Gregory Baltoro 75 liter, it made all the difference. As we passed mile 300, we reached the oasis I felt I so desperately needed. Deep Creek Hot Springs, the perfect therapeutic mixture of thermal hot spring and cool desert creek. The perfect place for an afternoon siesta. We would only end up staying an afternoon because the next day we would reach Silverwood Lake, which unfortunately would turn out to be the place that we would say our goodbyes to Cowbell. After a nap at the lake and a lunchtime pizza party, we would say our goodbyes. Oh yeah. You made in trail cheeses. Don't eat people. Don't pretend not to be hungry. And that put our trail family at just four, with Tidbits, Sunshine, and Cole and I. Rambo, Lieutenant Dan, and AWOL had all either slowed down or chosen to make other resupply stops, and we'd lost them around Mount San Jacinto. And Baloo had decided to get off trail just after Interstate 10. Shortly after, Rudolph would take an extended break off trail. We'd seen Emma on trail here and there, but nobody had seen her since the hot springs. And now Cowbell at Silverwood Lake. But what can you do but keep on walking? So the four of us pushed on because we had a mission to accomplish that evening. Mile 341, just a short walk from the trail, would be the famous Mickey D's at Cajon Pass. And I think all of us at that point were dreaming of Big Macs. By that point, we were just east of Los Angeles. 
and after spending a much needed night in a hotel room, we left the next day passing underneath the Interstate 15 bridge with only one goal, to put more of the desert behind us on our way to Wrightwood. Wrightwood wasn't like some of the other resupply stops that we'd had before, where we'd slow down and take a zero. We made it in for breakfast and we would be out shortly after lunch, because at that point, the summer months were only getting hotter and we had adopted a new strategy. Make it out of the desert as fast as we could. That afternoon, we were back at it with the weight of a fresh resupply on our backs. Are you just filming me eating cheese eating cheese? -its? That's exactly what I'm doing. <laughs> you can already tell you've lost weight while. Well. Yep. Definitely lost uh like muscle. <laughs> <laughs> Upper body. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Blisters are callous. Cold camping spot in the 
bushes. About to walk into the sun. It's gonna be glorious. So glorious. So day is day 30. And by the end of today, we will be approaching mile 500. Pretty dope. Nice. Got to cross that line with your second foot there. Oh, here we go. <laughs> You're going to cross? What do you mean? Oh, fuck. <laughs> you go walk <laughs> in. <laughs> yeah! <laughs> yeah, what do you feel? Uh, I feel good. I've been reflecting. You feel like you just walked 500 miles? Yeah. Oh, there yeah. you <laughs> You're different human beings. It feels better than, than hitting the 300. Yeah. The 300 the hurt. The 400 that we made. <laughs> yeah. The day after reaching mile 500, we would reach another unique spot to the PCT. So basically the desert kind of flattens out into the western arm of the Mojave. And the first thing that you come up to is this property known as Hikertown. Hikertown is unique to the PCT. It's got kind of a bonanza movie set kind of vibe going on. It's really a good spot for hikers to pull over and take an afternoon off and prepare for the infamous aqueduct section. For us, our stay at Hiker Town was just an afternoon. A quick resupply at the general store down the street and an attempt at an afternoon nap. Because just ahead of us, the trail would follow the LA Aqueduct north for 24 miles of open desert with no water sources. That's a six liter water carry. Now most will set out in the evening from Hiker Town to take advantage of the cool night air. For us, we hiked 10 and a half hours and covered the entire stretch that night. Mind you, we had already hiked 11 miles that morning to get to Hiker Town. And the next day, the rising hot summer sun would rob us of any sleep that we tried to get.
I think that was the best sleep so far. By popular vote, we would stay in Tehachapi for a zero before starting the last section of the desert. I once heard a hiker refer to their diet as being a 10 year old with no rules. And I think that probably applies more and more the farther you get. Pop-Tarts and Oreos, chips and candy, all became essential items in our resupply. Leaving Tehachapi well rested, we knew that the last 150 miles of the desert was going to be some of the most challenging. It was mid-June and at this point the heat was starting to become a real concern. We had read the afternoon before we left that farther south on the PCT, a hiker had tragically succumbed to the heat. One woman is dead tonight after collapsing in triple digit heat along the Pacific Crest Trail. And while night hiking was a better option than being under the sun all day, we had learned after the aqueduct that sleeping during the middle of the day wasn't really much of an option either. So our strategy would change. We would resort to early hiking and afternoon naps to avoid the heat and exhaustion. Tidbits, he's at less than a liter. Talk to Blade, less than a liter. Sunshine, one liter. Me, less than a liter. Rationing water. Rationing hot water. So thankful for every opportunity that I get to walk into a business and purchase a cold beverage for any time you're in a house. You just turn on the sink or the fridge and get the cold water in an instant. Never take that for granted. There's actually a dry stretch on this section of trail that's about 35 miles long and on foot that could take about a day and a half. Because of this, this section as well as others rely heavily on water caches provided by trail angels at no expense to the hikers. And really without their generosity, these sections would be far more difficult and sometimes impossible.
This is the swim spot. <laughs> mile 700. It might be the most anticipated mile marker on the PCT. It marks your last day in the desert, but most importantly, it marks your first day in the Sierra Nevadas. I had been awaiting the Sierra Nevadas since the day that I learned of the Pacific Crest Trail. And if I'm being honest, it's kind of the reason that I chose to do it in the first place. For me, it wasn't just a mountain range. It was an arena full of excitement for the unknown, a place to test yourself. Waiting for you just two miles up from the 700 mile marker is Kennedy Meadows, a small community overrun with hikers during the summer months and a welcome sight after such a grueling section. In past years, the general store had become somewhat of an iconic stop for Kennedy Meadows. And it's still a good option for a basic resupply. But one of my best zeros on trail was at Grumpy Bear's Retreat. It does. It's much better here. Hosting a bar and grill serving three square meals a day, laundry, outdoor showers, and a specialized PCT gear shop just next door, it's pretty hard to ask for much more as a hiker. Triple Crown Outfitters, right next to Grumpy Bears, is squared away in every aspect. You could do an entire pack overhaul there if you needed to. And the expertise of the owners changed the way I hike completely. At that point in our trip, I had pretty much accepted that I was gonna be getting three to five blisters a day for the rest of our trip or until the skin on my feet was gone. Triple Crown recommended that I trade in my shoes for a size or two up and wear in gingy toe sock liners underneath my darn tufts. And this completely changed the game for my feet. With Kennedy Meadows being a stop that pretty much every hiker makes, there were so many people there that we were able to either catch back up with or meet for the first time. We got to meet Chuck, Sachi Bomb, and Grant. We even got to link back up with AWOL. Once we had checked all the boxes for our zero, Kennedy Meadows was a place I didn't really want to leave yet. But the pull for the Sierras was stronger, so we set out one foot in front of the other with an excitement that I hadn't had in a while. maybe 10 miles outside of Kennedy Meadows. Alpine forests and 75 degree weather. Couldn't have asked for a better or quicker transition out of the desert. This is the life.
third day in the Sierra. This place is massive. On the third day out from Kennedy Meadows, we staged to climb Whitney at the Cab Tree Ranger Station on the west side. With the plan to summit at sunrise, we set our alarms for midnight. At this point, putting miles behind you is no big deal. But something the desert couldn't prepare us for was the altitude. And while it can be felt on the days leading to Mount Whitney, it'll hit you on the way up. It's kind of eerie how you can see the ridge line up there. Same here. 12,454. 12, well, it keeps going up. 12,810. Feeling the altitude? Feeling everything. Yeah, a little bit of lightheadedness. Definitely really tired. Summit of Mount Whitney was everything I wanted it to be. That afternoon we were pretty smoked after nearly 10 hours of going up and down Whitney. Rather than hike any further that day, we decided to pitch camp and put our feet up until the sun would rise the next morning. Whitney is sort of like San Jacinto, where the PCT doesn't actually take you up the mountain. It stays to the west. So like most, we had taken the 17 mile side trail to the summit. However, for those that choose to pass up Whitney, the tallest point on the PCT lies just a half a day's hike ahead at Forrester Pass. And after a high snow season, can be one of the more dangerous spots on trail. Forrester Pass, somewhere up there. That's super exciting, looking at those peaks. You gotta climb every one of them. Probably. <laughs> so 
surrounded by mountains. Two miles. Then I'll just do it there. It's a backbreaking one. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it should be pretty wet hanging off the path. The lakes are uh, like right on there, so. Yeah, that's fine then. I'm going to wash socks, but uh, I'm going to wash them today. Somewhat dwarfed by our previous day on Whitney, we made it up in over Forester Pass with little to no problem. There she is. We even had time for a cold plunge on the other side before moving for our next resupply point at Independence and entering one of the most beautiful mountain basins I have ever seen. So you need the chance. It's quick and easy and you get no hesitation. Oh. First Arch Pass, 28th of June, headed to Independence. To reach our resupply in Independence, another side trail hike was required, a down and back to Onion Valley Trailhead, a 15 mile round trip that would take us up and over Kearsarge Pass twice. There we are. You see the desert? There she is. Once we reached the trailhead, it wasn't long for us to find a hitch into town for the four of us. We were picked up by a trail angel who had offered to take us all the way to Bishop, a half hour north of Independence. He had promised that it was a better resupply and also offered a ride back to trail that afternoon. And it was true, Independence doesn't have much to offer as a resupply town, and Bishop was the better option out of the two, with several gear shops and a large Vaughn's grocery store. M&M's, <laughs> M&M's, family size. You did the same thing. Where's yours at? You got Oreos with you. What is that? <laughs> you want the whole box of stickers. Don't look at the hot chocolate. The low desert valley that Bishop and Independence sit in are a stark contrast from the mountain range we had just came down from, and an awesome reminder of the environment that we had hiked in in the first 700 miles.
we would make our second ascent of Kearsarge Pass that evening, stopping just short of the PCT to make camp that night. On the days that we only spent a couple hours resupplying, I always kind of wished that we could stay just a little bit longer to soak up some of the comforts of town. But oftentimes, the sunset in the mountains would make up for it. It's like the third little reflective pool with a stream. Little streams running through these grassy meadows with purple flowers. And just super impressive granite walls all the way around. I just want to pitch my tent and live here for the next four days. Our resupply in Bishop had prepared us to go up and over one to two mountain passes a day for the next five days and 85 miles. Or so we thought. Sometimes the mountains schedule their own fun. All right, you ready to go up the mountain pass? Lead the way. Dun 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 dun, Glen Pass. Oh my god. Is that the right lakes? would look like something beautiful, straight from a novel. The afternoons would bring the rain. Did this, where's this pass at? What? Where's this pass at? Still like nine miles up. Holy shit. All right. All right, let's do this. Second pass of the day. There that sucked.
good though. Such a beautiful morning. It's like 55 to 60 degrees right now. Just spectacular. What an amazing place. say what I've been thinking about for the last half mile is I think the fast-paced b-roll scenes of people walking covering miles adds to the euphoric and joyous vibe that they give off and I think a lot of people expect that feeling that they get when they watch those videos to be the same feeling they feel on trail, but that's simply not the case. There are moments like that when you turn around and you look at things like that. It's just beautiful. It inspires you. Maybe you feel joy looking at that, especially in person. I know I do, but every mile. miles every day of 20 miles every month of hundreds of miles all 2,652 of these miles are covered at no faster than this pace and on days like yesterday afternoon coming up an extremely long pass It really gets to you. It's grueling, it's tiresome. And it can put you in a really negative spot, even when you're around such beautiful peaks and amazing forests. This trail's got a lot of high and lows. And you will walk every step of those highs and those lows, regardless of how you feel. Look at this guy. There he is. Point nine. Point nine to the last water? Yeah. What about uh, which side does this? Which side of this range does this pass on? Um, that one over there. That dip. Okay. I don't know what it is about the mountains, but it seems like weather can roll up on you in an instant. And the Garmin provided forecast that says 10% chance of rain might as well be translated into 50 or 70% chance of some sort of precipitation. They said it'd be sunny on the other side. Almost as if it was scripted, the storm cleared as the landscape revealed the beauty that is the basin that joins Palisade Creek and the middle fork of the Kings River. That is 
all worth it. A sight that I don't believe a camera can truly capture. That night we camped near Grouse Meadows, a place that for me made the wet, the cold, and the achy feet all worth it, and somewhere that I plan to revisit as often as I can. Now, for the third day in a row, a storm would meet us on the mountain pass. Sunshine and tidbits made shelter while I hiked into the storm alone. I wasn't sure where Blade was at. I hadn't seen him since the start of the ascent up Muir Pass. And while searching for him in the storm, I ended up having to take shelter in a small wet cave with another hiker that we had met once before called Curious George. Eventually the storm let up enough and we were able to push for the top of the pass. And of course, at the top, Blade had made it to the shelter and had stayed dry and warm the entire time. No hard feelings, but he could have made me some of the hot chocolate that he packed from Bishop. Shortly thereafter, Tidbits and Sunshine made their way to the top of the pass. Welcome. Hello. <laughs> welcome, welcome I to both of you. I missed you. <laughs> <laughs> right alive, oh, Blade. But that's what I was excited for, right? A place to test myself. Excitement for the unknown. I guess one of those unknowns was how close thunder sounds at 12,000 feet. The weather cleared as it had the previous two days and we continued down the trail.
<laughs> it's like the first real river crossing. Well, this morning is, I think, July 2nd. Yesterday would have possibly been July 1st. At that point, it was safe to say that a trend had started. And with our next resupply point about only 40 miles ahead, none of us wanted to get rained on any more than we had to. Foul weather is a much bigger deal when you're living out of a backpack. Imagine the inconvenience if your bag soaks through and your sleeping gear gets wet. And then what if the sun doesn't come out long enough to dry it? Yeah, there are some steps that you can take to prevent that but those only work so long when you're getting rained on every day. Plus, foot care can be a lot harder when your feet are constantly wet. And at this point, Blade and I's feet were looking broken in. What's the name of this lake? Sally Keys. Sally Keys. Hikers. Beware. Two gators and one toe sock. Or blade, it could have been blade. He didn't have anything taken. Jokes on him, one of those gators didn't stay clipped to the front anymore. <laughs> Ready? It's blade's worst nightmare. Look, you can like, there's like, you can see the edge right there. Yeah, you can. That's pretty gross. Our next resupply stop wouldn't be a town. It would be a resort. And quite possibly my favorite stop on the PCT. Vermilion Valley Resort. the way to Vermilion Valley would be bittersweet because we would be losing a member of our trail family. Tidbits had decided that he needed to pick up the pace and would be skipping the resupply point at Vermilion. The four of us had hiked 747 miles of this trail and of course we wanted to stay together but with him wanting to push ahead and Blade and I wanting to slow down and possibly spend a couple days in Yosemite Valley later on trail we weren't sure if we would see him again. So for now, this is where our adventures would split. And sometimes that's just what happens on trail. With the intention of catching up to tidbits later on trail, Sunshine was also in need of a resupply and would accompany Blade and I to the resort. So after we said our goodbyes and wished each other happy trails, we set out on the side trail to Vermilion Valley Resort. 
This is the spot. Mm. <laughs> Everyone's on that side. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, it's been fun. Yeah. We don't want to Yeah, we do. Especially your socks. Huh? <laughs> My blade. I hope to see you again. Yeah. See you later. Bye, Mad Max. See you later. Yeah. Mm. Happy trails. Until then. Yeah. I gotta get going this way. Otherwise, I'm gonna turn around and take you off. <laughs> All right. Mm. That was fast. Up, up the the loose rocks. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Golden. Oh, golden boy. Golden pony. Like, no, it's pony. Pony boy. Yeah, it's pony boy. Stay golden pony boy. Yeah, yeah that's yeah. what it is. So that is saying that this trail has less switchbacks, and will save us time rather than using a different one. Yeah, because I think the one on the other side of the lake. I forget which one of these two it is. But maybe people take that one because it's shorter, but then you have to do more switchbacks to get there. Got it. It was a long, slow march out of Eden. We didn't know just what we were leaving. But our curious hearts had us believing we'd be okay. Mm -hmm. Along the path we ventured. Sweet. A lot of tents. Cole, you finally made it to paradise. I'll get you logged in, get a chip started for you, you know, yes, a cab. Yeah. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> Dun -da -da -da. Ta -da. Miscellaneous. Miscellaneous? All the seeds I'll never want to eat. <laughs> Why are there a bunch of seeds in that? <laughs> I told myself I'd be healthy. Is that why the crunch bar and the nerds are in there? Yeah. <laughs> the next map. <laughs> Have you been using that whatsoever? No. <laughs> and one pop tart. Oh, you gotta change that. <laughs> yeah. I'm one only pop tart. To, I'm only supposed to eat like half of one of these a day. I was totally off. I never counted my calories. Hey, I didn't put any pop tarts in my bag, so. Yeah, we were like, we're gonna go somewhat healthy with ours. <laughs> yeah, that changed real quick. This is a good base, but I'm gonna need to buy. Good base. Wine. Good base. What if we trip? What if we fall? Yeah, we like holy stuff. It was the chance we took with which we flirted. And the rush he gave and we For me, Vermilion Valley Resort was what I wanted so many other resupply stops to be like. Sitting deep in the Sierras on the west side of Lake Thomas Edison, it's a mountain lodge with good food, campfires, and a free beer upon arrival. Their resupply is a bit limited due to their remote location, but they pretty much carry all the essentials. However, in our experience, the hospitality of the owner and the staff more than make up for anything that they don't carry. And the overall atmosphere of the place had me quickly contemplating taking a zero day. While living our best lives, telling stories of the Sierras with fellow hikers, the three of us set out the next morning for the short hike to Mammoth Lakes. After a big breakfast and closing out an even bigger tab. But this time we were accompanied by a fellow hiker that we hadn't seen since Bishop, Sachi Bomb. Is it lake time? Oh yeah. Yeah? Lake time. Woo! Yeah! Woo! <laughs> 
Little Mammoth! Oh, I'm so excited. Just food. On the day leading to Mammoth Lakes, sunshine, Sachi Bomb, Blade, Chuck, a hiker we were just reunited with the day before, and myself crossed the 900 mile marker. The popular ski town of Mammoth Lakes is accessed from the PCT at Red's Meadow Resort where a bus runs to and from the town daily. Although we had just left Vermilion Valley the day before, it wasn't likely that I was gonna pass up an opportunity for town food. At least for me, town days on trail sort of developed into a holiday. And at Mammoth Lakes, we would take another Nero. Leaving out of Red's Meadow Campground, Sachi Bomb had introduced us to a new group of hikers. Grant, who we'd actually met in Kennedy Meadows, Rally, Quick Draw, and Polar Bear, all of whom we would end up hiking with to Thousand Island Lakes and then on to Tuolumne Meadows. Nighttime, nighttime it starts. The nighttime, nighttime it starts. Blade and I had had a plan to visit Yosemite Valley since before we set off in May, and Tuolumne Meadows was the place to do it, with a bus running daily from the camp store and grill down to the valley. But unfortunately in doing this, it would officially mark the end of the trail family that we had set out with from Idlewild. While Blade and I would head west to the valley, Sunshine would continue north on the PCT, hoping to catch back up with tidbits. So that afternoon at Tuolumne Meadows, we said our goodbyes 
after walking 790 miles together over the last 45 days. Through the desert, across rivers, and over mountains. The next day, Blade and I boarded the bus for Yosemite Valley. Okay, you ready to go? Yeah, all right. I am. Welcome for those of you who have just joined us here in Tuolumne Meadows. My name's Eric. I'll be driving the bus all the way down to Yosemite Valley. first afternoon in the valley consisted of routine river plunges off of the El Capitan Bridge into the Merced River and watching day turn into night in front of one of the most iconic and magnificent granite walls in the world. Wade and I both climb and to see El Cap in person gives you a new and renewed respect for what's possible in climbing. And so on our first day off from hiking, we decided to go on a hike up the Yosemite Falls Trail. Yeah, that didn't last very long. I'm sure if it was a different set of circumstances, we would have made it to the top, but with 900 miles fresh on our feet and it being mid-July, we decided we didn't need the extra switchbacks in our life. Plus, I'm pretty sure being in the valley in mid-July is probably the closest experience one can have to being inside of a microwave. We ended up scrambling to a spot about halfway up that looked like it could offer us a shower arguably a cooler experience. For the rest of our stay, Blade and I really tried to capitalize on the term hiker trash. For two days, we didn't really leave the deli. We just lounged around binge watching Game of Thrones, only leaving to get pizza and find a place to stealth camp. It was well worth it. We needed the rest, and being in the valley is cool enough on its own without doing all the trails. Plus, we got to meet a couple of other PCT hikers that we would see again later on trail. Crunchy bean and purple legs. Right up here. Pacific Crest Trail. Yep. Right across the road.
So this could be a problem. Not really sure where the fire's at. How do you feel after passing the most extreme, awesome pass in the whole Sierra Nevada? Same. This is the smallest pass in the whole Sierra Nevada. Is there something cool or significant about this spot? Nothing, nothing really. You should just keep walking. What's going on here? I do. My legs might get too stiff. <laughs> yeah, you stop walking too. Over a thousand miles into this. Heading out today. 5.03 a.m. Head to North Kennedy Meadows. I don't know why, but I am so hyped right now. It's early and it's cold, but I'm cruising. Feeling good. As I stated before, all aerial videography was filmed in the 2022 hiking season, which was a year that experienced more snow than my fellow hikers and I had in 2021. And while conditions are obviously different, I think it displays an interesting contrast in trail conditions year to year. As we hustled down the mountain range to catch the shuttle from Sonora Pass to North Kennedy Meadows, two new hikers joined us, Augusta and her daughter Catlin, who had been on the PCT since Tehachapi. North Kennedy Meadows is a small secluded resort with fishing, hiking, and horseback rides. It's equipped with a well-stocked general store for resupply and a restaurant. We ended up staying in the bunk style lodging above the restaurant and it was beginning to look like it was going to be a refreshing break off trail. But it was here that it seemed that the West Coast fire season was going to take its first effect on our trip. Eating breakfast the next morning, I read updates on my phone of a wildfire moving to intercept us on our path. The Tamarack fire had already caused evacuation in some small towns and parks and possibly sections of the PCT just 40 miles ahead of Sonora Pass. None of the PCT was officially closed yet, so it seemed like time was of the essence if we were going to make it past the fire before it grew too big and closed sections of the trail for the rest of the season. 
With a feeling of uncertainty, Blade and I, accompanied by a few other hikers, took the shuttle back to Sonora Pass that afternoon. So, breaking trail news update. It's Sunday the 18th, 18th of July, just after seven o'clock. Today's the day we find out if the trail's gonna be closed. Yesterday at North Canadian Meadows, we read that there's a wildfire about 40 miles ahead of us. And that they had evacuated the town of Marquis and the surrounding roads. No word that the trail's been closed. PCTA recommended that you stay off of it, but no word that it's officially been closed yet. We got off the shuttle from North Kennedy Meadows at three. Hiked 12 miles to camp last night. Today's a 20 to the Emmett Pass. the first road that's supposed to be closed so if there's gonna be a trail closer sign that's where it's gonna be we came over Sonora Pass yesterday and could see the plume of smoke rising from the fire and it was pretty big it's kind of concerning we're not gonna do anything dangerous but if we can continue uh, to maintain our continuous footpath than we're going to. I'm certainly gonna try. But we'll see, we'll see what happens. It's just a matter of time before they close the trail. So we just gotta get through this section before they do. But we're gonna find out today. Later that afternoon, we reached the saddle that overlooks the four miles leading to Ebbets Pass. And what we saw on the other side washed away our hope of making it past the fire. It's about two miles away. Unable to see exactly where the fire was in the valley, we decided that it wasn't safe to proceed down the saddle. So we would have to act on our contingency plan and backtrack 27 miles back to Sonora Pass. Officially moving south. Can't help it, a fire is a fire. But luckily for us, on our way back, we ran into Augusta and Catlin, who convinced us to camp with them that night and take another look at the conditions in the morning. It's the 19th of July and we're hiking northbound. We left the saddle above Emmett's Pass yesterday at around three in the afternoon due to a wall of smoke. It looked like it was starting about a mile down from the saddle. The trail leads to Highway 4. And we didn't really have a plan for getting off of Highway 4. But we've since been told that we can get a 
ride from the highway by a shuttle service organized by the sheriff. So, with a little bit of backtracking yesterday and a little bit of backtracking this morning, our plan is to hike the five miles down to Highway 4 at Ebbets Pass and get a ride from there to South Lake Tahoe. And overnight, the smoke on the saddle improved significantly. Thanks, Augusta, for talking us out of our 27-mile backtrack. We're doing it. No more backtracking for us. <laughs> fires up there. Even though we got the wind to our back, the smoke's starting to fill in. Tamarack fire is approximately eight trail miles north of here. It started as a spot fire on July 15th and has quickly grown. Alternate one no longer available. Trail officially closed from here to Highway 88. Alternate's no longer available. Did the third grader write that? It looked like it. <laughs> and before the rest of our group even got to the highway, a trail angel pulled up, looking for hikers in need of a ride. Uh, oh, oh yeah. With the incredibly well-timed generosity of another, we crammed in and set out on the road to South Lake Tahoe, unfortunately ending our continuous footpath across America. Well, at least there was a sunny spot there. How many times in California? An extra hitch later, and we made it to a cool little hostel in Lake Tahoe. As far as resupply towns go, Lake Tahoe is definitely worth a zero, which is exactly what we did. hiked on from Lake Tahoe, the days grew hazier and grayer until it was impossible for us to know 
whether the smoke we were breathing was from the Tamarack fire to the south or the Dixie fire to the north. <laughs> a common resupply strategy in through hiking is to have a friend or family member ship pre-packaged boxes of food and supplies to you. For things such as medications, this can be a great option because plenty of businesses along the PCT are willing to hold packages for hikers. But for us, it wasn't long into the trail before the things that we thought we were gonna be wanting to eat were not what we were eating at all. And we had wished that we had just saved the money on shipping. My enemy. Macaroni and cheese. <laughs> Are there any mountain house meals in here? Dang, that's unfortunate. Leaving Donner Ski Ranch, we knew that we had another big hurdle coming our way. We had heard that the Dixie Fire, a little over 100 miles north of us, was growing into a monster and had already closed sections of the trail. With some hikers already choosing to go around it, we weren't yet sure where we would get off to make the jump. But with few roads between us and the fire, it would probably be soon. Like, creepy cabin in the woods. Let's find the door. The wood locker? Yeah. Kind of creepy though. So, this blanket of smoke has been covering everything. Probably a combination of both the Dixie Fire and the Tamarack Fire. Definitely started when the smoke rolled in. On top of that, it's been a sore throat for several days. And today's the first day that I started developing a cough. I'm pretty ready to get out of the smoke.
was a short day. The 12 miles to Sierra City. From Sierra City, we jump up to uh, an old station, which should be uh, north of all the more cow fires, and hopefully north of the smoke. While the trail wasn't closed at Sierra City, Highway 49 was the last road that was open to get off trail before running into the Dixie Fire. So while it wasn't urgent, at that point we had little choice but to find a way around it. Trying to plan travel logistics in a place that you've never been is never fun. And perhaps being somewhat removed from society for a little while at this point definitely didn't help. We didn't really have any idea how we were going to get north of the fire. But with Sierra City not having any public transportation, our first task was to get a hitch somewhere west. That somewhere ended up being Grass Valley, California. And one more hitchhike later got us to Yuba City, where we were able to get a Greyhound bus to Redding. After a late night in Redding, a local bus service could get us to the town of Bernie. Then, for the last leg of our side quest, a Bernie cab would take us to Old Station and drop us off just a short walk from the trail. A quick shortcut through some nearby lava tubes, and we were back on the PCT. This is the sanctum. If we start to hear a phone ring, we should run in the opposite direction. This is easy compared to what we've done in the past. Yeah. The journey around the Dixie Fire put Blade and I on the north side of the halfway mark to Canada. While that's an exciting feeling at first, it can turn into admiration for just how long the trail is and the size of the task that you've taken on.
ACT Trail Angel. Probably pretty close. You ready to start your fourth to last day? Yep. All right. Into the wilds. We had known from the start that Blade was probably going to be leaving the trail early to go back to school for the fall semester. And he had decided that at Mount Shasta, he would be heading home, just a four days hike away. This is officially your last camp on trail. Yeah, the next one will be at a post office. <laughs> yeah, but it'll be off trail. Yeah. Last camp on the PCT. It's a nice one. What are you looking forward to the most leaving trail? Being clean all the time. <laughs> Not having to sleep in my own filth. Yeah, yeah. Not uh, opening the your quilt every morning to yeah. get that whiff of dirt and sweat of pristine hiker air coming back at you. Yeah, have clean clothes. Yeah. Do you know how far you hiked? Not yet. One thousand two hundred seventy-five and a half miles. You did you count it? Yeah. Yeah, I did the math earlier. 1,275 and a half. Yeah. That's... Over half? With the fires and everything. It's not quite half. It's yeah. almost half. It's pretty good. What do you think was the worst part? The end of the desert. The end of the desert? Yeah. It was worse than the knee pain? I don't know, that was pretty bad, but eventually went away. Yeah, but probably after Tehachapi. Yeah. That section of Joshua trees. Yeah, just Joshua trees, nothing else. Yeah. Yeah, being thirsty and having to ration sweat was pretty uh, intense. Yeah, it was, it was pretty scary. What was your favorite section? Oh, the Sierras. Yeah? Yeah. Is there a particular moment or just the Sierras? It was just all the Sierras. Like, I greatly enjoyed all of the Sierras. Yeah. When we first got into it, like, that day out of Kennedy Meadows, it was pretty nice. Yeah. It was, like, a really big change. Yeah. It was looking up after that section, because that section of Joshua Trees, which is the worst section, yeah. was just like two days prior to that yeah so it was, it was greatly looking up well damn are you gonna miss it yeah I'm sure i'll miss it but um i don't know i got a lot to look forward to at home as well yeah
perfect. Mastered the ramen bomb. Yep, it is. On Blade's final day on trail, and the day leading to Mount Shasta, we would hike to the post office in Castella and make camp, in preparation for the morning bus ride into town. Today is the day. Cool is getting out. Back to the real world. Oh. Yes, sir. Oh. Yep. Hey, I'm ready. We'll see you when you get home. Yep, you did good. Be safe. And just like that, Blade was gone. And it was just me on this quest for Canada. With almost everyone that we had met ahead of me, I was prepared to hike for Mount Shasta alone. But seemingly out of nowhere, another fire stood between me and Canada. The Haypress River Complex fire. With some quick research, and hikers already having to be evacuated from the next trail town to the north, it seemed like there was little option but to go around it from Mount Shasta. So with one long taxi ride north, I went from Mount Shasta to Syed Valley, leaving just 36 miles between me and the California-Oregon border. For me, the last few miles of California were euphoric. So much had happened since we set out from the Mexican border over 1,600 miles ago. It was not only exciting, but hard to imagine that there were still two states in between me and Canada. as well as an undeniable excitement that both Oregon and Washington combined were only a little over half the distance of California, which meant reaching Canada wasn't only more possible in my mind, but in reality, a more probable outcome. At this point, you've worked out all the kinks. You know what your body can do. Just keep going. Keep doing what you've been doing. Keep your body free of injury, and if the PNW allows, you'll make it to Canada. I am so close. 
to Oregon. Just up this trail. That's insane. Of course, we finished California on an uphill. I'm so psyched to be out of this state. It's been great. It's been fun, but this is a hell of a benchmark. Especially in, or in Oregon. Such a beautiful morning. Just a day after crossing the Oregon border, you can celebrate the completion of California with a real bed and town food in the town of Ashland. I wouldn't end up staying long in Ashland. After all, I had a brand new state to cross. And just up ahead, a few people that I hadn't seen in a while. For the next two days, I would briefly get to catch back up with AWOL and Chuck, neither of whom I had seen since the Sierras. At this point on the trail, everybody's pretty much hiking at their own pace. So it's not uncommon to see hikers in passing day to day or week to week or at common gathering spots, usually involving a hot meal. On the trek from Ashland to Crater Lake National Park, I would be introduced to Princess and later Kate and Cowboy. from three months. The landscape in Southern Oregon seemed to be a lot flatter than that of California. And it seemed as if my pace quickened, maybe even subconsciously eager to get to Washington just a little bit faster.
so basically, it's the 15th of August, and I'm at Crater Lake. That's pretty much what's up. I hiked all night. Yeah, from about nine nine o'clock to to one a.m. and hiked up to the Watchman Overlook that looks out over the west to east side of the lake. The smoke is still thick enough at sunrise that I can hardly see. I can see the reflection of the other side of the lake. I can't see the other side of the lake. So that's dope. It's questionable. Oh well. You don't know unless you try. <laughs> as it looks. It's also chilly. See my breath. It's like nine o'clock and I just have like, I've hiked like 10 yards. <laughs> this is what I expected Oregon and Washington to be like. Just rainy and gloomy. A good walk. It's like 60 degrees out here. Open the vessel. That's a general store. I'd hiked in with Cowboy, Kate, Crunchy Bean, and Purple Eggs. We shared a couple meals together, and it was a welcome feeling to be with a group after hiking solo since Blade left. They would end up having plans in Ben, and I would once again be leaving solo from Shelter Cove, headed north towards another obstacle. Up ahead, the lion's head fire had started and I wasn't sure yet what effect it would have on my path. 
But for now, the sun was out and the weather was nice. So why not put some more miles down on the way to Washington? bane of the PCT. One of my favorite trail recipes is a pack of chicken flavored ramen noodles and one pack of Chick-fil-A sauce. I think it's probably good, but maybe only if you've been on trail for at least 100 days. Best part of Oregon, by far. The lion's head fire was coming up, and I was running out of food. So rather than hike hungry for another day over fields of lava rock, I decided to hitch from McKenzie Pass to Sisters and then take a bus to Bend where I could formulate a plan to get around the fire. My plan right now is to leave Bend tomorrow, go to government camp and see how far south I can get, uh, hitching to start back up. Starting from government camp, Cascade Locks, It'll only be two and a half to two days. So potentially just two and a half days left of Oregon. If I get farther south to where I'm wanting to get, it can be three to four days. That's kind of surreal. Kind of surreal that it could almost be entering the last state on this trip. I ended up getting in touch with a trail angel offering rides to and from trail. A green cab called Uber Ducky. He agreed to take me north of the fire. Though our first attempt was halted by car trouble, the next day he drove me around the fire. It would have been much harder and taken far longer without him. Thanks, Uber Ducky. Looks like it's true. Kinda got involuntarily vortexed and been back in the woods now. Three and a half days from uh, Washington. Why would you look outside yourself when you have all of the world inside? One, two, three, four. Yeah, your heart is 
I bet Blade is dreaming of Idaho and mashed potatoes. <laughs> I'm about 20 miles from Timberline Lodge. It's like 11.35. I'm thinking get to Timberline Lodge. Close to Timberline Lodge. Tonight. Breakfast there tomorrow. In the sing with the mountains. Why would you look outside yourself when you all of the world inside Why would you look outside yourself when you have all of the world you say, inside Why would you look outside yourself when you have all of the world inside Why would you look outside yourself when you have all of the world inside Your mind is a space that creates your horizon well, Your mind is a space it just kind of like hit me all of a sudden like wow this is the last stretch before Washington like when I hit town again it'll be Cascade Locks and it's not even a long stretch it's like three days it's crazy Washington is like the last state and the last big stretch like just up ahead. It's a surreal experience. Thinking of the trail, of the future trail, like what's to come when you're like in the desert or in the Sierras is like sublime. Like you can't wrap your head around how long it is because you think how long you've already been going and you're like, wow, I'm like a quarter of the way through. And like, how much walking you're gonna do and how long it's gonna take you and how big of a journey it is. And the same, I think, goes for thinking back on it, even though you did it, even though you accomplished that already. I still can't comprehend <laughs> how far I've, I've walked. It's truly special. About to make a very anxiously <laughs> awaited breakfast buffet at Timberline Lodge. Reservation in 15 minutes. There's the front. Five fifty, that's a breeze. That was one of the best views so far, and then poof, all of a sudden just gray.
came very close to Washington. Five or six more miles and I'll be turning onto the highway to Cascade Locks with Washington sitting just on the other side of the river. I was going to leave Cascade Locks yesterday and I didn't drink any water the whole day but I drank a lot of beer and I didn't make it out. It's 8 o'clock in the morning. I'm going to go get some breakfast and then uh, head for Trout Lake. bridge of the gods. To those driving past you, it's probably no more than an inconvenient toll bridge on the way to wherever. And you, no more than a glitch in their thoughts to avoid hitting. But for you, in those steps over the Columbia River, you own the moment. You are living. It's the culmination of months of physical and mental effort that fuel your feeling of pride and accomplishment for yourself, as well as the anxiety of the first few steps in a new state. A feeling that you've only had twice before, but this time different, because you know it's the last time. And with the realization of that, the anxiety turns to excitement. Bye, Oregon. Couple steps from Washington. Here it comes, here it comes. Ready? Ready? For most, 500 miles is out of the question. But for you, at this point, you know it's only a matter of weeks before you'll be at the Canadian border. And your body and your mind are yearning for it. Washington holds over 27,000 more feet of ascent than Oregon did. And with that, the promised beauty of the Cascade Mountain Range. That is, if the fire season allows for it. The fires I had passed to the south had only gotten worse and eaten up more of the trail and unfortunate nearby communities. I was thankful to have been there when I was and hopeful that the remainder of the path ahead of me would remain open. toe update so you can see my middle toe is missing half the toenail little toe is missing the whole toenail
Tuesday the 31st of August. I'm gonna try and do 25 miles today. Oh, yeah, looking forward to Trout Lake. It's the first resupply in Washington. Start busting them out, get through here. Look at that. First September. This is the month I should finish in. I plan on getting to Canada somewhere around September 22nd. It's 38 degrees. I'm in shorts. A light jacket. I have a deadline to make this morning. I gotta make it 10 miles by 10:30 to catch the shuttle to Trout Lake. I make that time. Pancakes and coffee, boy. Pancakes and coffee. Let's pick up the pace. The first sunlight of the day right up here. Oh, it's beautiful. There we go. <laughs> yeah. Perfect. I can already feel the warmth. For anyone wondering, when you get to places like these forest roads, how you get um, a ride in such a random spot as this. Um, there's really kind people that put things like this up. A bus would arrive at the forest road intersection on time as advertised letting off a crowd of hikers returning the trail, including Crunchy Bean, Purple Legs, Kate, and Cowboy, all of whom I hadn't seen since Shelter Cove. From the beginning of the ride into Trout Lake, it was obvious that kindness was a staple of the small mountain town. With no lodging plans, I was offered a bunk at Camp Jonah, a Christian camp and retired school that had just finished up its summer retreats and was now somewhat of a hiker hostel with free showers and laundry. Just a short walk from the town cafe and general store. After just one night, Trout Lake definitely hit my list of best resupply towns on the PCT. Shortly before heading back to trail, AWOL arrived at Trout Lake, and we'd catch back up and even hike together a bit on our way to White Pass. She was the only hiker that was still around from Blade and I's early days in the desert. Everyone else was either no longer hiking or so far ahead or behind that I probably wouldn't see them again. Well, it's 9.50, just now leaving camp. This is the, uh, definitely the latest I've ever left. But, you know, a lot of times it's just really good to enjoy. Moving north, the trail would wrap around Mount Adams, showing off its leaky glaciers, perched high on the mountainside. First real look at Mount Rainier. Thank you. 
what an amazing spot. What a, what, how could, to, how could there be a better day? Amazing camp spot. With a beautiful sunset. Clear starry skies. Beautiful sunrise. And a short day ending in pizza and beer. <laughs> Time to leave this beautiful place. I don't wanna. So, I just had to check on the map just now because I couldn't believe it. The trail actually goes through snow. The very first snow I'm gonna walk through on the whole trail. <laughs> Love it. Hope that doesn't cause problems for me getting to Canada. Possibly infamous because it's not actually a Cracker Barrel. It's just a convenience store. This guy is just a Cracker Barrel. Got a shower yesterday. Onward 356 miles to Canada. I still stand by my previous conclusion that the uh, trail is the definition of sublime because thinking back on 2,200, almost almost 2300 miles is uh, hard to wrap your head around even after doing it it's wild what it really boils down to is just how far can I go before I have to have pizza and beer what wilderness area do we got now The smoke was to my south, meaning it was behind me. And as far as I knew, the trail ahead was clear. It was a straight shot to Canada.
this is Washington. This is the Washington I expected. But even in the rainy mist, sometimes you never know what you'll find in the mountains. Yeah, wow, that was truly awesome. Ice Axe and his buddies up there, just multiple pop-up tents, beer, coffee, muffins, brownies, fruit. Uh, they serve breakfast for hikers. They're gonna serve lunch in a couple hours, or actually in 10 minutes. Uh, they're gonna serve dinner with margaritas. Just uh, camping out, having a good time. Wow, that is maybe the best trail magic I've come across so far. And, and that is a really nice thing to, to find, especially on a cold, foggy day like this. You know, you make a plan, I plan hike 22 miles, make camp tomorrow morning, hike four miles. Well, the weather moved in. I'm gonna bust out a little over four more miles, Snow Quality Pass. Fingers crossed the inn at Snow Quality Pass has room available. Called the inn, got a room, two nights. I would zero at Snoqualmie Pass, visiting with a friend from the real world before disappearing back into the mountains. It seemed like for the march out of Snoqualmie that the Washington weather would pick up right where it left off. How amazing it is to go to bed getting rained on and shiver all night to wake up to sunshine and clear skies. Let the dust settle, let go of the battle, there's too much here. Let these towers turn to rivers that these instincts steer. Let the dust settle, let the stormy weather ride out disappear. When the sunlight shines, let it all come clear. glory of this. Wake up, peel the tents away, and it looks like this. Out of the clouds and down to Stevens Pass, a hitch would be required from the ski resort to the Bavarian village of Leavenworth, 4,500 feet below the mountains. Touring all the Bavarian restaurants, I would take a zero with Cowboy, Kate, Crunchy Bean, and Purple Legs, who I had now caught up with. About to leave Leavenworth. The next four days are 100% chance of rain. It's gonna be cold and it's gonna be wet for four days. And uh, everyone I know is gonna wait it out. But I'm gonna go, I'm gonna do it. I wish I could tell you I knew this was a terrible plan. 
This is what I asked for. That was the last time I picked up my camera that day. Jeez, what a bad plan. Uh, the right move is definitely to stay here in Leavenworth. Yeah, I ended up having to come back. Around noon Friday is uh, when I got to the trail. I mean, five miles in, and uh, I can already tell my rain gear is starting to get soaked through. So, I only made it nine miles in. Uh, I guess in the back of my mind, I knew that that was the point at which uh, if I was gonna turn around, it had to be then. I thought about it for a little bit, wrestled with it, and decided that, that was the move to make because that stretch was going to be over five days and the rain was going to be for four of those five days and uh, maybe the sun comes out Monday uh, or maybe it doesn't and then maybe I'm wet and my sleep system is wet uh, which would make my dry clothes wet for five days and uh, uh, heading back one mile, came into came to a uh, a trail intersection, and saw some other guys that had come up this uh, alternate trail, and told me that instead of hiking eight miles back on the PCT, I could hike about five miles. Uh, I figured shaving three miles off of my trek back put the possibility of getting back before dark, uh, getting into town before dark. So I took it, took the side trail, led to a forest road. Walked the forest road. Uh, before I even got back to the highway, uh, a car came coming down the forest road, uh, picked me up, took me to the highway, and uh, then I spent probably what well, felt like an hour, but probably a half hour, um, hitchhiking on on uh, Highway Two, uh, a couple miles east of the ski resort at Stevens Pass, and uh, that's when I got real cold. I'm going to finish a little later than I wanted, but that's how it goes. That's part of the adventure. I wish I could remember the man's name that picked me up off the highway. He had almost a full truck of PCT hikers in need of a ride off the mountain. When I got into Leavenworth, it was late and all the hotels were full. But thank God AWOL had just gotten into town and she let me stay a night in the cabin she had rented. For two days, we waited for sunshine to be forecasted in the mountains. On the third day, that's what we got, and we hitched back to the trail. I'm kind of glad I made that first attempt to get back on trail. I think it would have gnawed at me if I hadn't. And it made me somewhat wary of the conditions my fellow hikers and I might face if we didn't get to Canada soon, as winter crept closer to the border. Well, headed out of Leavenworth today. Take two, we'll see what happens. The trail's much drier. And I was walking on a river last time I was here. Try and take advantage of the good weather while I got it. Feels good to be back on trail, starting to feel stuck there in Leavenworth. But that's all good, because we're back now. The small group I had hitched from Leavenworth with began the 107 mile hike out of Stevens Pass headed for the small mountain town of Stahican. It's like that all the way around. Hope it doesn't rain. God, I don't want the rain. Yesterday afternoon was another suck fest. It definitely started raining enough to get pretty wet and cold. 
it got below freezing all the condensation and rain that had gotten on the tent froze over i can't tell you how happy i am to wake up and see the sun is out that's i was ecstatic the joy that comes over you waking up to see the sun my whole body will warm up and i'll be able to set my tent my sleeping bag everything out and dry it out it's gonna be a good day talking to a few other hikers up here that have gotten weather forecasts. Looking like there's gonna be another storm. I'm not equipped to uh, handle winter storms, which is what it's described as. A couple inches of snow at elevations from 6,000 feet to higher. Right now I'm at 6,200 feet. The guy with the forecast said that it looks like rain on Sunday going until the forecast ends. And it's probably gonna make my turnaround to get to the border for the last stretch. Get pushed back for an unknown amount of time. I just want to get to the border. With a population of about only 75, Stahican offers a top off on supplies on your way to Rainy Pass in the town of Mazama. Or for those receiving a resupply box, it's the last stop on the way to Canada. Just checked out the map. So we over 50 miles. a rainy pass that gets me to Mazama. So I've decided to completely skip Stahican. Because as it is, I'm not gonna make it to Rainy Pass by tomorrow. It's just too many miles to do. With over 50, I'm going to try and do two 24 mile days. That way I can try and wake up early Sunday. To get to rainy pass at a decent time before the rain starts. Better get moving. A lot of miles to do today. to finish up 15 miles before lunch. 5,000 feet of elevation gain complete. Boy, do my legs hurt. After learning of the impending wintry mix headed my way, a 29 and a 25 mile day would get me to Rainy Pass. And lucky for me, the fall colors attracted a swarm of sightseers, making getting a hitch down to Mazama easy work. Split in two by a river coming from high up in the mountains, Mazama is a small town, perfect for one last resupply and to wait out the storm. It hosts a single general store and cafe with some of the best pastries, as well as a hidden gem of the PCT, Raven's Roost, hosted by Carolyn Ravensong Burkhart, the first woman to solo through hike the PCT in 1976. It's sort of a hiker haven for those about to push for or just returning from the border, or in my case, waiting on a storm. While there, I ran into a familiar group. Cowboy, Kate, 
Crunchy Bean, Purple Eggs, and Bennett. I offered my congratulations because they had just reached the Canadian border and their adventure was coming to a successful end. Although the weather was perfect in Mazama, reports from the trail made me glad that I was in the comfort of town. AWOL had made it to Stahican when the storm hit and confirmed that the weather was too bad to push for Canada. I ended up waiting three days in Mazama, and on the fourth morning, decided it was time to push for Canada. It's Wednesday the 29th. A little chilly at 40 degrees, but up on the mountain, it's more than likely, more than likely a chilly one. It's still supposed to be snowing and raining for two more days, today and tomorrow followed by clearer skies Friday. My goal is to hit the Canadian border on Friday. Whoop. Back on the PCT. Shout out to Ken, picking me up. 60 miles to Canada, 20 miles a day, three days, including today. So, the first of October should be the day that I am done. On the way up, there was visible new snow. It's chilly, it's in the 30s. Get on with it. Oh man, there it is. Just ran into uh, Nine Lives in Teva. They turned back. They actually looked pretty miserable. I said last night was not a fun night in the storm. I am hoping but tonight is not as bad as whatever they had last night. I'm gonna spend at least tonight out here. Keep on going. I've had a thought running around my head that I should just do the last 40 miles of this thing all in one stretch. My highest mileage day is in the 30s. But the reasoning would be, well, all my shit is wet. My quilt is soaked. And I know it's possible. I know I can do it. I hiked in the frozen rain until I reached Hearts Pass, the last forest road that the trail crosses before Canada. Sheltered in the doorway of a pit toilet, I ate lunch as the rain grew heavier, and I began to weigh my options, heavily considering making efforts to get back to town. But then out of nowhere, a familiar face came around the corner, Emma, the same Emma that Blade and I had met back at Paradise Valley Cafe and shared a cabin with in the town of Idlewild. She was staying in a friend's van at the Forest Road campground. I guess I looked pretty cold because she offered to let me dry out in the van. With the weather holding steady, four more hikers ended up joining us throughout the afternoon. And the van ended up being our room for the night. Kindness like that when you need it the most, whether it's a little bit of trail magic, a ride, or shelter for the night, leaves a lasting impression of the good in people and one that you'll want to pay forward. Zero five, 12. It's 30 miles to Canada. So the, the plan today, taking off this morning is get to Canada in 30 miles by a decent time this afternoon.
as the sun rose revealing clear skies and white mountaintops. I knew that reaching Canada wasn't only a greater possibility, but going to be under some of the best conditions I could ask for. The only thing left was to do the miles. About 11 miles out from Canada. I'll tell you what, it doesn't feel like it, but I think I'm gonna make it. Two miles from Canada. I don't know how I feel about that yet. It doesn't feel like it. I think maybe it just hasn't hit yet. Like I can't really believe that it's only two miles away. I mean, I can see mountains on the, on the Canadian side. It just doesn't feel real. Maybe it won't really set in until I see it. Point two miles out from the terminus. Starting to feel a little funny. I don't know, I can't believe this is about to happen. Not sure if this is actually real. Oh good lord. I just caught a glimpse of it. Shit, is this it? Terminus. That's been a hell of a trip. All right, four miles to camp, 30 miles to Hearts Pass and then we're out of here. Thank you for watching. If you made it this far, you should probably just quit your job, get off your couch, and go for a through hike. It's really not that hard. Just get yourself to the terminus and let it go from there. <laughs>